Hello, welcome back everyone. I want to give you this lecture uh, on meiosis and we'll talk about meiosis today in detail and then we will also talk about the comparison between meiosis and mitosis and then finally I will show you a few different karyotypes about some of the uh, diseases that you are required to know. Okay, so let's start with meiosis today and um, the primary function of meiosis is to reduce the ploidy, and by ploidy I mean the number of chromosomes um, of the gametes from diploid, which means to have two sets of chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad, to haploid, which means to only have one set of the 23 chromosomes. So we want to make sure we reduce the chromosomes from 46 to 23, because that's going to be important when fertilization of a uh, sperm joining an egg so that we'll have the correct number of chromosomes. And the second part of meiosis is that this is where genetic variation comes from uh, because genetic uh, random assortments of genetic uh, material will combine in the gametes so that you are a mixture of both your mom and your dad. Um, that is uh, important to ensure variance in offspring. Okay, some other things about meiosis. It occurs in the life cycle, life cycle of only sexually reproducing organisms. If you're an asexually reproducing organism, you will not go through meiosis. Of course, it reduces the chromosome number in half, and it provides the offspring with the different combinations of traits from either that, from that of either of their parents. Okay, an overview of meiosis. It begins with one diploid parental cell, it requires two cell divisions, it ends with four haploid daughter cells, and it involves pairs of chromosomes called homologs that are inherited from each parent. Homologs um, are chromosomes that have the exact same types of genes on each of them, so perhaps genes of hair color or eye color. So in meiosis 1, because there are two parts of meiosis, in meiosis 1, the homologs line up side by side at the equator. And when homolog pairs separate, each daughter cell will receive one member of the pair. At that point, the cells are now haploid, meaning they have half of the required genetic material. As I said, normal human cells, aside from your gametes, are diploid, having both sets of DNA. Meiosis II. Before we get into meiosis II, no replication of DNA will occur between meiosis I and meiosis II. The centromeres that contain the sister chromatids will divide and the sister chromatids will migrate to opposite poles to become individual chromosomes. Each of the four daughter cells produced will have the haploid chromosome number. And really, essentially, each chromosome will be composed of one chromatid at that point. So let's take a look at what this looks like visually. So um, here are the homologous chromosome pairs. You can see one large blue and one large red and one small red and one small blue. The diploid number here is four. Now, here we've duplicated those chromosomes so that we have the blue, large blue being duplicated, the large red being duplicated. These are still the homologous pairs. The homologous pairs line up during meiosis one and then they separate so that each now only has half of the required DNA material. So now these cells are haploid. Then if you take a look, this essentially looks like mitosis, where the sister chromatids then further divide so that each will have one of the chromosomes in the final cell. So meiosis two is actually very similar to mitosis. Meiosis one is where the differences occur. Okay, fertilization, of course, uh, is when you get those daughter cells of meiosis that mature into gametes, sperm in males and eggs in females. Sperm and eggs fuse during fertilization. Fertilization restores the diploid number of the chromosomes. Haploid plus haploid will equal diploid. And that, of course, creates a cell that will develop into a new adult individual. Meiosis requires two nuclear divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two. It results in four haploid daughter cells, and each of them is haploid, as I said. Okay, meiosis one is divided into prophase one, anaphase one, metaphase one, and telophase one. Meiosis helps ensure genetic variation, 
And that genetic variation occurs in two ways, crossing over and independent assortment. Okay, here is meiosis one, prophase one, the next one is metaphase one. I don't know why it was, it said anaphase one first on the last slide, but metaphase one comes next with the homologous chromosomes align at the center of the metaphase plate. Anaphase one, the homologous chromosome, chromosomes separate. They're pulled to opposite poles by the centromeric spindle fibers. And telophase one, the daughter cells have one chromosome from each homologous pair. And then um, interkinesis means just the time between meiosis one and meiosis two. So here's what that looks like in a little bit larger. In prophase one, the homologous chromosomes pair up which uh, is called synapsis. Metaphase one, homologous chromosomes align at the metaphase plate. Anaphase one, homologous chromosomes separate. They are pulled to opposite poles by the spindle fibers. Telophase one, the daughter cells uh, have one chromosome each from each homologous pair. And then interkinesis, the chromosomes still consist of two chromatids and it's the time between meiosis one and meiosis two. Uh, here is that again. In prophase one, synapsis occurs, and when synapsis occurs, crossing over occurs. And crossing over is what happens when a little bit of one uh, chromosome crosses over with another one. So that you can see here, synapsis occurs, crossing over between non-sister chromatids occurs. So that a little bit of the red is now on the blue, and a little bit of the blue is now on the red. What this means is that these new chromosomes are completely unique from these chromosomes because the genetic material has been exchanged. So this allows for potential genetic variation in the offspring. In metaphase one, the homologous pairs line up at the metaphase plate. And here's what that looks like. Now this sort of deal, independent assortment, is the other way in which genetic variation can be be uh, added. And all that means is that chromosomes may line up in any possible combination at, at the metaphase plate. Here we saw that both of the blues lined up on the left side and so both of the blues ended up in the left daughter cell. You could say or right here you could have had blue and red and red and blue so that the daughter cells could end up like this. Either of these possibilities could happen and it is random chance on which it occurs. So independent assortment is just the ways in which the uh, duplicated chromosomes line up at the plate uh, during metaphase. It's random, and which uh, types of genetic material gets into which daughter cell is completely random. That adds genetic variance. Okay, uh, this is just showing again the independent assortment happening during metaphase one. Uh, Depending on how they align, the maternal and paternal member of each pair could be oriented toward either pole. It occurs when they separate, and it just depends on what order they lined up on. Uh, independent assortment generates cells with different combinations. In humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so the number of possible combinations is actually 2 to the 23rd, or 8,388,608 different possible variations. And this value also does not include genetic recombination due to crossing over. So there, that's why you look similar to your parents, you don't look identical, and you definitely don't look identical to your neighbor. Telophase one may or may not occur at the end of meiosis one, but the nuclear envelopes reform, the nucleoli reappear, and cytokinesis may occur, which produces two daughter cells, which are haploid, but still have duplicated chromosomes. Okay. There's what that looks like. Interkinesis is just the period of time between meiosis one and meiosis two. There is no more replication of DNA. Notice that the cells are haploid, but they still have duplicated chromosomes. Okay, meiosis two. Meiosis two is very similar to mitosis. The cells have one chromosome from each homologous pair. The spindle fiber reappears and the nuclear envelope disassembles again. Each duplicated chromatid attaches to the spindle fiber, the nucleolus disappears. In metaphase two, the sister chromatids line up at the metaphase plate. During anaphase two, the sister chromatids separate and become daughter chromosomes that migrate toward the poles. During telophase two, the spindle fiber disappears, the nuclear envelope reforms, and cytokinesis occurs. Here's what that looks like. Now, you would be forgiven if you might think that looks a lot like mitosis. 
And it does because this is exactly what happens during mitosis. Essentially, the sister chromatids line up at the metaphase plate. They are separated during anaphase, telophase. This, all this looks very similar to mitosis. But what's happening here is we're working with haploid cells. In mitosis, we're working with diploid cells. Okay? Show you what that looks like, a, a zoomed in view. Okay, the importance of mitosis. Well, it's very important that we produce haploid cells that have the correct haploid number. Genetic variation is also produced here, and it produces cells that are no longer identical to the parental cell. Genetic variation occurs in two ways, first by crossing over, and second by the independent assortment. Upon fertilization, combining of chromosomes from genetically different gametes will help ensure that offspring are not identical to parents, which is important. It's the main advantage of sexual reproduction because long-term genetic variation increases the survival of the species. If we were all so genetically similar that one disease could kill all of us, that would not be a good thing, right? So genetic variation is very important for the long-term survival of the species. Now let's compare and contrast mitosis and mitosis and include the events of prophase one and the difference between the ways the chromosomes line up in metaphase one and metaphase of mitosis. And we'll talk about significant differences here. They are very similar processes, but mitosis is the doubling of chromosomes followed by one cell splitting and producing two diploid daughter cells. In meiosis, we double the chromosome material, but we follow that with two divisions. In mitosis, we get 46 pairs during metaphase one, where in meiosis, we only get 23 pairs during metaphase one. And in meiosis, chromosomes can swap material, but that does not happen in mitosis. DNA replication occurs only once prior to either meiosis or mitosis, and meiosis requires two divisions, meiotosis requires one. Meiosis produces four daughter cells, and meiosis, mitosis produces two. The four daughter cells from meiosis are haploid, while the two from mitosis are diploid. The daughter cells from meiosis are genetically different, while those from mitosis are genetically identical. Meiosis occurs only at certain times of the life cycle of sexually reprodu reproducing organisms, right? At sexual maturity. After you have reached sexual maturity, then you want to produce gametes. But mitosis occurs continuously in all tissues throughout the entire life of all, of all individuals. It's part of growth and also repair. That's mitosis. Here's what this looks like. So they are very similar, but you can see here that during metaphase one, it is the homologous pairs and not the sister chromatids that are lining up. So this is meiosis one. In uh, my uh, compare, well, if we were to move on, um, we could talk about meiosis one and mitosis. Uh, again, the homologous chromosomes are pairing up. The paired homologous chromosomes align the metaphase plate, not the sister chromatids like in mitosis. And the homologous chromosomes separate, whereas the sister chromatids separate in mitosis. Here's that just written out for you. Okay, um, but whereas in meiosis two, we get no uh, pairing of chromosomes. We get the haploid duplicated chromosomes pairing at the plate where this is, look, sister chromatids separating, whereas sister chromatids separating. So like I said, meiosis two and my mitosis are actually quite similar, but you still end up with four haploid daughter cells whereas here you get two daughter cells that are identical. Okay, the last part of this lecture is to describe some conditions and look at the karyotypes. Now, I'm not going to show you all the conditions listed in the objective. I will show you, however, the karyotypes for the ones that work. Um, okay, uh, the first is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a case of trisomy 21, three chromosomes occurring at the 21st uh, spot. Um, a few of the common traits of Down syndrome are low muscle tone, small stature, an upward slant of the eyes, and a single deep crease across the center of the palm. Every person that has Down syndrome is a unique individual and may possess these characteristics to different degrees or not at all. But Down syndrome is an occurrence of three chromosomes instead of the normal two at spot 21. Kleinfelter syndrome is trisomy 23. 23 are the sex chromosomes. So here, 
we have an individual who has two X chromosomes and a Y. A normal female is an XX and a normal male is an XY. Here we have an XXY. And it's a condition where males have an extra X chromosome. Again, the normal male is XY, a Klinefelter male is an XXY. Some things that you'll see about Klinefelter syndrome will be less body hair, breast enlargement, and just overall typical more uh, female-like features. Klinefelter syndrome, um, you'll see where you'll get abnormal body proportions, long legs, a short trunk, shoulders that are equal to hip size, abnormally large breasts, infertility, sexual problems, less than normal amount of pubic armpit and facial hair, small firm testicles, and tall height. That is Klinefelter syndrome. Turner syndrome, which is monosomy 23. Now look, there is no Y chromosome here, but only one X. So this is a female with only one X chromosome. Uh, and so they either have a partially or they could have a completely missing X chromosome. A normal female, again, would have two X chromosomes. A male would have one X chromosome, but a one Y chromosome. There is no Y chromosome here. So this is Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome, you'll see uh, a lot of different things uh, happening here. Um, Turner syndrome, you'll, be sh you'll see shortened stature, a low posterior hairline, neck webbing, uh, something going horribly wrong with the aorta, broad chest, um, widely spaced nipples, uh, streak ovaries, infertility. Um, yeah, so these are the things to look for in Turner syndrome, where this is the thing to look for in Klinefelters. Okay, with that being said, I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. Let me know if you have any questions.